It's another misty day out here in Northern California, and today we have gotten our hands on the all-new Ford Explorer Hybrid. For 2020, Ford is giving us a ton of different engine options. There's a fleet-only naturally aspirated V6, there are two turbocharged engines, and then there's this all-new hybrid system. It's based around a 3.3-liter V6 engine, a 44-horsepower electric motor, and a 10-speed automatic transmission. What's interesting about this hybrid system is that its design has absolutely no relationship with the hybrid system that we find under the hood of the Ford Escape. So in, for instance, the Toyota Highlander Hybrid, they simply scaled up a RAV4 hybrid system to make it a bit more capable of driving a bigger crossover over, but for this, Ford developed an entirely new hybrid system. They did not simply scale the one up from the Escape. And Ford did that because this hybrid system has a very different mission than the one that we find in the Highlander Hybrid. This one is designed to tow, towing capacity of 5,000 pounds, notably higher than the Highlander at 3,500. In this video, I'll be focusing mainly on the hybrid model that's right next to me, but I'll also be talking a little bit about the 2.3 and 3 liter turbo engines. If you want to know more about those engines in greater detail, there's separate videos on our channel already. You can go ahead and find those. And then we're going to have some update videos because there are obviously some new entries in this segment. So we're going to be borrowing a 2.3 liter turbo version of the Explorer here very soon. You can expect that video probably in about a month or so. The most important thing to know about the hybrid version of the Explorer is that Ford is positioning this differently than the Highlander Hybrid. So you can get the Highlander Hybrid in much less expensive trims. The Explorer Hybrid is only available in Limited. And that means that this is significantly more expensive starting than the base version of the Toyota Highlander. And as a result, we also have a bunch more standard equipment on the hybrid version than we find obviously in the base Explorer or in the base Highlander. Up front, we have full LED headlamps, high beams, low beams, fog lights, turn signals, and this daytime running lamp. They're all LEDs. The LED turn signal is a pretty discreet little separate element there. It doesn't flash this entire strip, as you can see over there on that side. For this generation, Ford decided to keep the Explorer styling pretty conservative, so this looks very much like the Explorer that came before it, even though this shares essentially nothing with the outgoing Explorer. For this generation Explorer, Ford decided to move back to rear wheel drive, but this is not an SUV variant of the Ford Ranger. This is a unique unibody platform that's shared at the moment simply between this and the Lincoln Aviator. The switch to rear wheel drive is definitely obvious because we have a longer hood and a definite rear wheel drive proportion. You'll notice that the front tire is definitely pushed further forward than you'd be able to in a front wheel drive based vehicle. We have a shorter front overhang and a longer wheelbase as well. The Explorer out on the road reminds me an awful lot of a discount BMW X5. That's not a bad thing to be reminded of at all. And at the moment, this is one of only two rear wheel drive based crossovers available in America. Now, I know some folks would want to say that this and the Dodge Durango are SUVs, but in the truest sense of the word, this and the Dodge Durango are the only crossovers left in America. And something like a Toyota Highlander could arguably be an all wheel drive boxy minivan. In theory, the crossover term means that we have some truck-like attributes and some passenger car-like attributes, and the Explorer has a unique unibody passenger car style platform, but it has the same 10-speed automatic transmission that we find in a Ford F-150 and the same base 2.3-liter turbo engine that we find in a Ford Ranger. At 198.8 inches long, the Explorer is solidly a mid-size crossover. It slots almost exactly between the Dodge Durango and the Toyota Highlander, being three inches shorter than the Dodge and four inches longer than the Toyota. This is an important six inches shorter, however, than the Chevy Traverse. That means that the Explorer is going to be a lot easier to park. But in terms of driving dynamics, this is a lot closer to the Durango than the Highlander or the Chevy. Depending on the version you get, you'll find either 18, 20, or 21 inch alloy wheels on your Explorer. The hybrid model here gets 20 inch alloys and 255 with tires. These are pretty wide tires. The Highlander Hybrid gets 235, which is a little bit surprising for the Highlander, but these are some of the widest tires you'll be able to find in the midsize crossover segment. If you get the sporty versions of the Explorer, then these bump up to 275 with tires. Moving to the rear, we find combination tail lamp modules with amber turn signals. The turn signals and the backup lights are incandescent, but the brake lights and the parking lights are LEDs. Down at the bottom, we have dual exhaust tips even on the hybrid trim. There are a number of reasons why Ford moved the Explorer back to a rear wheel drive platform, and among them are towing performance, performance generally speaking, and of course driving dynamics. Generally speaking, rear wheel drive transmissions can handle more power and can cool themselves more effectively because of where they're located in the vehicle. That gives them more room. So rear wheel drive transmissions tend to be physically larger and slightly differently designed than front wheel drive transmissions, and that allows them to cool better 
and handle more oomph. This also allowed Ford to align the drivetrains a little bit more closely with their pickup truck line. So the base engine for consumers is a 2.3 liter turbocharged four-cylinder engine that produces 300 horsepower and 310 pound-feet of torque. It's basically the same engine that we find in the Ford Ranger. Now if you're a fleet customer, there is also a 3.3 liter naturally aspirated V6 engine that's basically borrowed out of the Ford F-150, but you won't really find that on the Ford dealer lot. Next up, there's a 3-liter twin-turbo V6 that's logically related to the twin-turbo engines that we find in the Ford F-150, and that comes in two different power levels, 365 horsepower and 400 horsepower. Both of those engines come standard with all-wheel drive. Then there's the model that we're taking a look at here that pairs a variant of the 3.3-liter naturally aspirated engine that we find in the Ford F-150 with a 44-horsepower electric motor and basically the same 10-speed automatic transmission that the rest of the lineup uses to give us 318 horsepower combined and 322 pound-feet. The automatic transmission is the key difference between this and the Ford Escape. The Ford Escape uses a planetary power split hybrid system that thematically is very similar to what we see in the RAV4 and the Highlander hybrid. This uses something very different. This uses a traditional automatic transmission and basically an axial or a pancake electric motor between the engine and the transmission. The position of the electric motor means that this vehicle can drive down the road electric only using just the 44 horsepower electric motor, obviously not for too long of course. And then it can also combine that electric motor power with the engine power to give you that 318 horsepower total. The key design element here is the 10-speed automatic transmission. In a planetary power split style system like we find in the Ford Escape, there's always going to be some energy moving along the electrical path. So one motor generator unit is generating electricity, sending it over to the other motor generator unit. That results in a bit more loss when you need high torque delivery, and also results in a bit more heat. As those systems scale up, they also need larger and larger electric motors. Over here in the Ford Explorer, we have just one 44 horsepower electric motor that's much smaller than the motor that we find in the Highlander Hybrid and that traditional 10-speed automatic. The benefit to this system is that even if the battery is completely depleted and there's nothing to run the electric motor, we still have that traditional 10-speed and we have that traditional 10-speed feel. So this vehicle is relying less on its electric motors than the Highlander for locomotion, but it still has them there to help improve fuel efficiency. The downside to this style of hybrid system, whether we're talking about a Ford Explorer or a very similar system in a BMW X3, or X5 is fuel economy. This is rated for 28 miles per gallon. If you choose all-wheel drive, that drops down to 25. That's not only notably lower than the Highlander Hybrid, but it also is not significantly better than the base 2.3 liter turbocharged engine. In this trim, it's four miles per gallon better than a comparably equipped 2.3 liter turbo, but if you choose all-wheel drive, that delta drops down to just two miles per gallon. As with any new vehicle, towing capacity depends on the options you select and the engine that you select as well. The hybrid model has the lower towing rating in the engine lineup at 5,000 pounds. If you get the 3 liter twin turbo engine, that bumps things up to 5,600, and the 2.3 liter turbo splits the difference at 5,300 pounds. A big difference between this and the Highlander Hybrid is that we have a factory two-inch receiver here, seven-pin and four-pin wiring harness connections, and we don't have a factory hitch for some reason on the Highlander Hybrid at the moment. Now there is a Toyota aftermarket accessory, but it's not gonna come from the factory like that. You have to have the dealer install that, and there is a little bit of splicing and dicing going on. On the downside, Ford does not give us an integrated trailer brake controller in the Explorer, a feature that I really wish they had. Front seat comfort is pretty good in the Explorer Hybrid. We have a multi-way power adjustable driver's seat with two-way adjustable lumbar support in the exact same range of motion over there for the passenger seat. We also have a powered tilt telescopic steering column, a little bit rare in this segment. You'll really only find that in a few models. And this is memory linked to a three-position memory over there on the driver's door. Now, unfortunately, we don't have four-way adjustable lumbar support, a feature that I really wish we got. The rear doors open nice and wide, but one thing I noticed is that there's a really wide sill between the seat and the door opening itself. That means that if you have shorter legs, it's gonna be a lot easier for you to rub your pant legs on the dirty door sill down there. One disadvantage to going to a rear wheel drive platform is space efficiency, and we don't find quite as much room in here as you'd find in something like a Kia Telluride, which is actually a little bit shorter overall. But at 114.2 inches of combined legroom, this is still about four inches larger inside than the Toyota Highlander. I've been really disappointed with the combined legroom in some of Toyota's latest models, and the Highlander is no exception. It really seems to have shrunk on the inside versus the previous generation model, so the Explorer is still going to be more comfortable inside. And that's long been one of the reasons that the Explorer has sold so well, especially in the previous generation where it was the best-selling three-row crossover in America because it was enormous inside with a big cargo area behind. But as with any new car design, there are going to be some compromises, and interior room seems to be one of the compromises that went on for this generation. Seating capacity is another one. The Explorer Hybrid is available only as a six-passenger vehicle, and you can get an eight-seat version of the Highlander Hybrid. 
In fact, like many competitors, there is no eight seat version of the Explorer at all. We get two seats up front, three seats in the middle, or two captain's chairs like we have right here, and then two seats in the way back. It's also worth noting that most of the trims of Explorer are six passenger crossovers. It's really just the lower end trims that have the seven seat option. Still, we have a decent amount of room in here. If I scoot all the way over to the right side, this front seat's adjusted for a six foot five passenger. I have about four inches of legroom left, and the second row seat slide forward and backward to help you apportion the space a bit more equitably. Hopping into the third row is pretty easy. We have a power tilt slide mechanism for the second row seats, but unfortunately you can't leave a child seat latched into place and still activate that mechanism. If we pull these seats all the way back there, and then I flip up the rear headrests, which do fold down, you'll notice we have a lot of room back here. The Explorer is still one of the roomiest third rows that you'll find. As far as the numbers go, this ties with the Honda Pilot and third row headroom, but this actually feels a bit more spacious because if you were to sit in a more normal position, then I have about three or four inches of headroom back here. This is a very large area. One of the ways Ford gets to the headroom numbers is by slamming the seat bottom cushion pretty close to the floor. You can really see the distance between my thigh and the seat bottom cushion. That means that adults are gonna find these seats a little bit less comfortable for long distance travel. On the other hand, we do have some cup holders back here and well positioned air vents for the third row seats. In all versions of the Explorer, the third row is a two-person bench. This is similar to what we see in the Dodge Durango and likely for a similar reason. Since this is a rear-wheel drive vehicle and it was designed for wider tires in the rear, the wheel wells end up intruding a bit more into the passenger area and that just didn't give them enough room across the third row to give us three seat belts. The previous generation Explorer had an enormous cargo area. It was practically minivan-like, but this generation is a little bit different. We have 18.2 cubic feet of storage space back here that is a little bit lower than I'd like, and this hatch is also a little bit lower than I'd like. Some taller drivers might end up finding themselves bopping their heads on that. If I take that 22-inch roller bag out of there, which will only fit in the position that it was in there and close the hatch, then we find a little bit of additional storage space right here under the load floor. I can take this load floor out, for instance, and then you can see how large it is. I can easily drop a 22 inch roller bag in there like that, but we still have less storage area than we found in the previous generation. The hybrid system doesn't affect the storage capacity of the Explorer because they don't locate the battery back here. Instead, the 1.5 kilowatt hour lithium ion battery pack is liquid cooled and it's about the size of a briefcase. It's located right here, sort of under the rear passenger seats. That allowed for not only to give us the same cargo area that we find in the non-hybrid model, but also to give us a temporary spare tire. I would have preferred a full-size spare, but a small spare is better than none at all. And lastly, something I wish more car companies would do, this rear load floor is reversible. So you can put it in either this position with the carpet up or this position with the hard plastic up. As we look around the interior, keep in mind that the Explorer Hybrid comes in just this one trim, the limited trim. The large panoramic moonroof extends to just over the second row passenger's heads. We have integrated side shades right there in the rear doors, height adjustable shoulder belts for the driver and front passenger, and ratchet style four-way adjustable headrests. We have leather upholstery up front with moderate bolstering on the seat back and seat bottom cushions. Larger folks shouldn't have any troubles with these seat designs. And then we have perforated leather inserts in the middle because these seats are actively heated and actively ventilated. The front doors are made from a combination of hard and soft touch plastics. The lower portion of the door right there, that's a hard plastic, but everything above that is a soft touch material. Then we have a lot of stitching going on here as well to dress things up like the stitched insert right there around the armrest. This model has the B&O audio system. That's sort of the discount brand from Bang & Olufsen. Moving over to the dashboard, we find a lot of soft touch materials going on here and some very interestingly styled trim. The trim has a sort of 3D effect going on here. It's imitation wood trim, but it's not really trying to imitate any wood specifically. You can see it looks sort of, I guess, like maybe mocha swirl, something along those lines. We then have soft touch upper and lower sections of the dashboard and a large bin style glove compartment. I was just barely able to fit a 10 inch iPad in here. Moving across to the dashboard, we find the smaller of two LCDs offered in the Explorer. This is an eight inch touchscreen. If you get different versions of the Explorer, then there is a portrait orientation screen that's a little bit larger. As you can see, this offers Android Auto and Apple CarPlay integration. And this is the Sync 3 version of the Ford software. So if we go over there, you'll see this familiar interface. We see this in a wide variety of different Ford products. This is not the latest version of Ford Sync that we're gonna be seeing, for instance, in the new Ford Bronco or in the new F-150 for 2021. There's a storage cubby right over here that obviously disappears if you get the Explorer with the larger screen. We have some physical buttons for that infotainment system 
and then a direct access button to the 360 degree camera system. I really love that feature. I love being able to turn it on for parking maneuvers. Engine start, stop button right over there. We then have the controls for the climate control system here. This is a three zone climate control system, heated and ventilated seats. And these seats remember their settings. So if you last had the seat on ventilation or on seat heat and you hop back in the car, it will remember that setting, which is a nice touch. Down here, we have a very large storage cubby. This is where we find the USB inputs for the system and definitely enough room to store several smartphones in there. You can see that's one of those larger smartphones. I also have the trailer brake controller for my trailer right here. Again, no integrated trailer brake controller in this vehicle, but there is a little slot there where this Prodigy controller will just about fit. We have a rotary style shifter here, manual button right there in the middle, electric parking brake button. This is the auto brake hold button, two large cup holders there. We then have a traction control disable button and then drive mode selectors right here. This is not an all wheel drive trim. The center console lid is softly padded. It opens to reveal a moderately sized storage compartment. Remember, this is a rear wheel drive vehicle, so the transmission is located somewhere under this center console that does limit some of the console room. We have a wireless charging mat right here. You basically just put your phone on its side, right like that in that area. It's canted at an angle so that way the phone stays in place. On the left side, we don't find a power eco and charge gauge like we find in many hybrids. Instead, we have a traditional tachometer. Obviously, when the engine's off, it's down there at zero, and then the ready light is on. In the middle of everything, we have a large multifunction LCD. This gives us a digital speedometer, the speed limit readout right there. And you can also get things like the eco behavior grade score, so you can see how your acceleration, deceleration, and speed were. Tire pressure. We also have trip computer economy here, average details. It'll tell you, like we see in some other Ford hybrids, once that little warning goes away, how many miles you've gone in electric. So 26 electric miles, mainly downhill there. The Eco Coach will tell you how much power you're using, whether you're in hybrid mode or electric mode, and it will also help guide you in regenerative braking. The steering wheel is a round design with minor sport grips up top, a split bottom spoke right there, and paddles on the back. We have down on the left and up over here on the right. These are traditional shift paddles. They're not regenerative braking paddles or anything like that. These are the controls for the radar adaptive cruise control over here. Ford splits the infotainment controls, so we have volume up, down, and mute over here on the left. Track forward, backward over here on the right, and these also double S phone hang up and pick up buttons. The buttons on top here control that multifunction LCD. Even though we get more power out of the hybrid system than we get out of the 2.3 liter turbo, this is gonna be slower zero to 60. In our tests, we got 7.6 seconds in this model, 6.7 seconds in the 2.3 liter turbo model. The big reason for that is the curb weight. This model weighs almost 5,000 pounds. It's really just about a cupcake shy. That means that this is significantly heavier than the Highlander Hybrid. Now the Highlander Hybrid is still gonna be slower zero to 60 because it has a lot less power. 8.2 seconds in the Highlander Hybrid versus 7.6 over here. But if you get the 2.3 liter turbo again, it's gonna be 6.7. It's also gonna stop shorter at about 118 feet, 60 miles an hour back to zero. This model took 122 feet to go from 60 miles an hour back to zero, but a Highlander Hybrid, it's actually a little bit longer again at 130 feet, likely due to the fact that that has skinnier tires. Toyota's hybrid systems also don't switch as smoothly between regenerative braking and friction braking, and sometimes that does cause their 60 to zero score to be a little bit longer, because the reaction time for some reason in the system seems to be a little bit longer than competitive hybrids, like the Ford Explorer hybrid. When it comes to handling, I'm gonna give this model an A minus. I do like the rear wheel drive dynamics. I like the way that it feels out on the road, but remember that this is heavier than something like the Highlander hybrid. And it's obviously heavier than the 2.3 liter turbo or the three liter turbo as well. So if you want the better handling option, then clearly either of the turbo options are gonna be your choice. But that said, if you like the way a rear wheel drive vehicle feels, you have just two options. You have this and you have the Durango in this particular segment. This is the only hybrid rear wheel drive option that is gonna be less expensive than one of those luxury entries, something like a BMW X5 or upcoming Mercedes plugins. And this is certainly gonna feel more engaging than something like a Volvo XC90 plug-in hybrid that does give us more power and in some ways it's gonna be more fun, but it's not gonna have the same kind of driving dynamics we find here. That's a front wheel drive car primarily, 316 horsepower on the front axle, the remainder of the 400 horsepower on the rear, and you can get a rear wheel drive version of this hybrid. When I first drove the Explorer Hybrid, I was driving a pre-production model up in Oregon, and I noted that the hybrid system didn't seem quite as well sorted as I had hoped, but it seems like Ford has really ironed out the kinks. The big thing I noticed there was transitions between EV mode and hybrid mode. For instance, we're in EV mode right now. I can see the tachometer's at zero. If I press on the accelerator pedal, it actually is pretty smooth. It feels very much like the average hybrid out there. The pre-production models were a little bit herky-jerky. Also, if we take this to a complete stop, Obviously, we're regen braking there. The regen braking feel 
is definitely better in this than it was before. The transitions between friction braking and regen braking are pretty good. And like other hybrids out there that use traditional stepped automatic transmissions like the Hyundai Kia hybrids, this is going to regen brake through the transmission. So mechanically power is flowing from the wheels through the transmission to the electric motor. So this vehicle has to continually downshift as you're regen braking. And this certainly made that smoother than when I first experienced it. Since this hybrid system is theoretically all about towing, let's talk about towing for a little bit. Obviously this is a unibody vehicle, so you're going to get a little bit more trailer rattle or hitch rattle in the cabin than you would in a body on frame vehicle like a Ford Expedition. But that's pretty par for the course for any crossover out there. And I think that Ford has done a pretty good job of trying to isolate it a bit more than we see in some options. We actually get a little bit less of that hitch rattle in the cabin, for instance, than we do in my Durango. Again, a key difference between this and the Highlander is the 10 speed automatic transmission. We also have a larger displacement engine, 3.3 liters versus 2.5. The greater displacement means we have a bit more engine braking potential, and you'll really notice that going downhill. We have these definite shifts, we have a lot of gears to choose from here, and it's definitely easier to keep this trailer under control speed-wise just using the engine braking than it is with a vehicle with a smaller engine. Remember that in any hybrid, when the battery pack is depleted, you're left with just what the engine can provide. And this engine does give us more horsepower than we find in the two and a half liter hybrid engine in the Highlander. That's really noticeable because this still feels considerably peppier out on a mountain pass. If you're towing a trailer and you need to pass someone and you've already been driving pretty aggressively and that battery pack is empty. I give ride quality an A in the Explorer, really regardless of which model we're choosing. Ford did a good job of trying to balance handling and overall ride quality in the Explorer knowing that the Explorer is bought by families that want to do road trips, that sort of thing, haul boats out to the marina. And ride quality is definitely going to be important, especially if you're out on slightly rougher road surfaces like the gravel road that we're on here. Remember that as you work your way on up the trim ladder, we do get lower profile tires in the Explorer, and that is going to reduce the ride quality, especially when it comes to smaller imperfections. I think large imperfections in the road are still handled pretty well, but you are going to feel some of those smaller imperfections come into the road if you get the lower profile tires. Now again, remember that the Explorer does have wider tires than the competition as well. In our cabin noise test, we got 71 decibels at 50 miles an hour, making this one of the quieter options in the three row crossover segment. So I'm going to go ahead and give cabin noise an A, but things aren't quite so rosy when it comes to fuel economy. Theoretically, a hybrid like this is supposed to be all about fuel economy. And even when we haven't been towing a trailer, we haven't been getting the 28 miles per gallon that Ford is claiming. Our average, our best average in our fuel economy loop was 24 miles per gallon. Out in daily driving, we've been averaging about 21 miles per gallon. And with this trailer connected here, we've been averaging about 18 miles per gallon. Those fuel economy numbers are not bad by any stretch, but I suspect that in the same driving situations, the 2.3 liter turbo might actually be more efficient. Because in our quick drive loops of that 2.3 liter turbo, it was getting pretty much what the EPA said it should get. And the hybrid, whether I'm talking about the pre-production hybrids up there in Oregon or this final production model hybrid here in California, just have not been able to get what they're claiming. It's also worth noting that fuel economy is significantly below the Highlander hybrid. With this generation of Highlander, Toyota really decided to focus on fuel economy rather than performance. That's why they downsized to a four cylinder engine. If you treat it gently, you can get near 40 miles per gallon in that Highlander. And I suspect the average person out there will be really hard pressed to get below 30. But over here in this hybrid, you could be getting under 20 miles per gallon, depending on exactly how you're driving it. Bottom line in this hybrid system, I think is pretty easy. Ford has done a great job of giving us a very tow capable hybrid. So if you wanna drive a hybrid and you wanna be able to tow 5,000 pounds and you tow very regularly, this is gonna be the better option, I think. Depending on where you're towing and how you're towing, this could get better fuel economy when towing than the 2.3 liter turbo. However, in daily driving, the 2.3 liter turbo is going to go faster zero to 60. It's going to stop shorter from 60, and it's probably going to get you better fuel economy out on the highway. The prices you see on your screen are 2021 prices because Ford has recently announced a pretty aggressive price cut across the Explorer lineup. The hybrid model now starts $50,600. That's about $2,800 less than it did last year. Even though we have a pretty significant price cut, it is still a very different price tag and a very different animal from the Highlander Hybrid, its closest natural competitor in the US. The Highlander will start at $38,200 for the base model with front wheel drive, 
If you attempt to comparably equip it to the model that we were driving today, a Highlander Limited would start at about $45,050. That's still about $5,000 less than the hybrid limited version of the Explorer. All-wheel drive is about a $2,000 option on either of these vehicles, but remember that we get a mechanical all-wheel drive system on the Explorer Hybrid and an e-all-wheel drive system on the Highlander Hybrid. So the Highlander Hybrid system is not going to be quite as capable in inclement weather. With that out of the way, let's dive right into the Explorer versus Highlander comparison. The important thing to know about the Explorer is that even though its price tag is about $5,000 above a comparably equipped Highlander, it's more likely that you'll get more cash on the hood at the Ford dealer. And at this point in time, we're still seeing Highlander hybrids selling at or slightly above MSRP. So that really could drive the effective cost of the Explorer hybrid down to a very similar price point to the Highlander. The Explorer is going to be bigger on the inside. We get 114 inches of legroom versus 109 inches of legroom in the Highlander. So the Highlander definitely has a smaller third row. Now the Highlander does have a three person third row though. So you can get eight seats in that model and you can't in the Explorer hybrid. The Explorer is also going to give you a slightly larger cargo area, although the Delta is not as big as it used to be. The Explorer used to have a really, really accommodating cargo area. It was almost minivan like, and that really has shrunken down thanks to the rear wheel drive platform. On the other hand, that rear wheel drive platform really benefits when it comes to extra power as well as towing ability. We get 318 horsepower, not 243 in the Highlander, and it will tow 5,000 pounds, not 3,500. The downside to all of this, of course, is fuel economy. According to the EPA's website, at $3 a gallon, you're going to spend $500 more a year fueling your Explorer Hybrid than you will a Highlander Hybrid. During the week that I was driving the Explorer Hybrid, it really struggled to get anywhere near those EPA ratings. And the last time I drove the Highlander Hybrid, it really matched or beat those EPA numbers every single time. So in real world driving, you can expect that difference to actually be a little bit larger than $500 a year. But I think the real problem for the Explorer Hybrid is not the Highlander Hybrid, it's actually the the 2.3 liter version of the Explorer. It's sitting right there on the Ford dealer lot. It's going to be much less expensive. Despite the price cut, the hybrid system is still a nearly $5,000 option on the Explorer. And which one is more efficient for you will really depend on the kind of driving that you do. If we're talking about the all wheel drive model, the 2.3 liter turbo actually gets one mile per gallon better out on the open highway. And in our real world driving, the 2.3 liter turbo was honestly really close to the EPA numbers, much closer to the EPA numbers than the hybrid model. In addition, the 2.3 liter turbo is going to be faster zero to 60. It also has a smoother automatic transmission because we don't have that hybrid motor and the clutch pack in there. It just feels a little bit more traditional. Oddly enough, the 2.3 liter turbo will also tow more. So the turbocharged model is going to be significantly less expensive. It's going to be a little bit smoother out on the road and it's going to tow a hair more. It's not going to be that much less efficient either. According to the EPA, even if we go by their numbers, which in real world driving, you may actually get slightly better fuel economy in the turbo, as long as you're not doing a lot of stop and go driving. According to the EPA, that difference should be about $150 in favor of the hybrid. Now at an acquisition cost of just under $5,000 for the hybrid system, that means your payback window is going to be about 30 years. If my money were on the line, I have to say I would just get the 2.3 liter turbo. This is truly one of the best base engines available in the segment. It has excellent performance. It's faster than most of the optional engines that you'd find in the competition. And the fuel economy is absolutely excellent. Again, on the highway, one mile per gallon better than the 3.3 liter hybrid. Now, clearly none of these options are going to be as fuel efficient as the Highlander hybrid, but the Highlander hybrid is going in a different direction. It's really sacrificed performance and towing ability in order to give you that 10 mile per gallon better fuel economy figure. But I should also say that if you're looking to spend over $50,000 on your next Ford Explorer, I would probably take a look at the Lincoln Aviator instead. It starts at $51,100 and it's definitely a nicer place to spend your time. Let me know what you think about that down there in the comment section below. What would you get if you were shopping in this segment? I suspect I would just get the 2.3 liter turbo if I really was interested in towing. And if towing is not on your list at all, then I would get the Highlander Hybrid because of its better fuel economy. Be sure to let me know down there in the comment section. Check out the merch that's available down there as well. You can find us over at facebook.com slash alexnautos. If you want to see the lighter side of things, find us over at Instagram, and I'll see all of you next week.